Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks brought to you by Kraft Analytics Group. My name is Lindsay Solitar, and I'm a first year student at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation, Football and CTE, How New Data Can Save the NFL. Please join me in welcoming Chris Nowinski, co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation to the stage. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here, and I appreciate you guys coming to a talk on CTE. I know it's a little different than what you usually get here, but we finally you know, have enough data in this space to actually talk about statistics and analytics in an interesting, interesting way. So I've, uh, as was mentioned, I'm co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. I'm a co-founder of the Boston University CTE Center, where we've been studying the brains of NFL players and other athletes and military veterans exposed to trauma. We're learning about this disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And you may look at this title and wonder, does the NFL really even need saving? We've talked about CT, people have predicted the doom of football, and that hasn't happened. Football is as strong as ever right now. Uh, but the reality is we haven't really seen all the data yet. And the new data that we've been seeing, uh, I think, forces us to confront the issue of whether or not we really need to change this game uh, once we realize how bad it's been for the brains of football players. And I say that as somebody who played myself. I uh, played at Harvard. I'm actually, after watching that last talk, I'm very glad I stopped 20 years ago so people couldn't analyze me like they do today. Some pretty interesting stuff. Um, but so let's, let's jump into it. We're going to talk about CTE. So CT is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that can only be confirmed post-mortem. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, you see these CTE lesions around blood vessels in the depths of the sulcus. This is uh, basically uh, part of the brain, it's a, a protein in the brain called, called tau protein that's a normal structural element of the brain that through some process inspired by trauma begins to break down. And it breaks down around blood vessels at the depths of the sulci. Uh, we believe just is caused by physics injury. Stretching of brain tissue can cause this degeneration. Um, it is, we're talking about it now because it was widely ignored by the medical community. We knew about it as punch drunk. As, recent, uh, as early as 1928, it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, but we weren't looking at brains to really understand what it was. So there are only 42 brains analyzed and published in the literature that had CT prior to 2005. So there wasn't much that we could learn. And if those of you who follow this closely, might, we actually who, we do this all the time. We recognize these brains. We know who they are. This one is actually Aaron Hernandez. He died at 27, started playing football very young, stopped playing football at 24, already had what we could define a stage three disease out of four. So a shocking level of disease in someone so young. So you've also heard there's a debate about whether CT is real, whether it's caused by trauma, caused by football. I would argue that debate has been over for a long time. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, our national public health body, put out the first fact sheet in 2018. They said, the, the research to date suggests CT is caused in part by repeated traumatic brain injuries, including concussions and repeated subconcussive head impacts. It's important to realize, they say, is caused in part by, because we haven't figured out all the details. And when we talk about whether there's cause and effect, a lot of people like to focus on well, we haven't figured out genetics, we haven't figured out the number and the types of head impacts. And I would argue for the conversation we're having today, that stuff is irrelevant. It's sort of figuring out exactly how many cigarettes it's gonna take you to get lung cancer. It's gonna be different for everybody, and it's gonna take us a lot of time, uh, energy, data, and, and supercomputing to actually figure that out. But right now, we just know you get hit in the head, you get this, uh, you could get this. And if you don't get hit in the head, you don't. What caught everyone's attention a couple years ago was we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that 110 of the first 111 NFL brains that we studied had CTE. On the one side, there was a lot of alarmism uh, because 99% is a big number, but we, we tried to frame it as this is out of our sample. This is a small sample of NFL players who died during this period. So it doesn't mean 99% of NFL players have this, but Finding it, finding it in 110 or 111 is concerning to us because it shouldn't be that easy to find. Uh, and then the, and the other half said, ignore it because uh, it's, it's so biased it doesn't mean anything. Well, the reality is it means something. 
And, what it, and it's premised by this idea that we just don't see this in normal people. Right? We are, what our brain bank is in the same building as the Framium Heart Study. We work with the same researchers. For those not from here, it's a town just outside of Boston. It's been followed for three generations. Uh, two, hundreds of their brains have now been donated to Boston University. We have all their medical records for their whole life. We know the sports they played. They don't get this. This is not in the normal population who is not exposed to brain trauma. So when we took that 110 and 111, people have now tried to figure out what does that really mean? Can we estimate overall prevalence of CT in NFL players? And one publication from two epidemiologists was very interesting in trying to predict what it could be, because the reality is we just don't know. And what they noted is that in those 111 cases, that happened to be uh, not, 110, 9.6% of NFL players who died during our study period. So we were collecting brains from 2008 to 2015. We got 110 with CTE, and 1,142 NFL players died during that period of time. So the minimum prevalence in that group is 9.6%. How can we look at that and understand what it really could be? And so we're going to go back to this curve they created and trying to predict what, you know, making some assumptions, what could that prevalence be? So to estimate the prevalence, the authors did simple but really insightful math. Uh, they created a number of scenarios to help us understand it. One would be, let's assume that we got 100% of the CT brains in the NFL population and that the prevalence is only 10%. In that scenario, 100% of families with a loved one with CTE chose to donate. And then only one out of 1,032 families who did not have CTE chose to donate, right? We'll call them non-cases. So the prevalence would be only 10%, but you have to start to wrap your head around this idea that non-cases uh, knew they were non-cases and that the, the cases who had it were a thousand times more likely to donate. Now let me add a little perspective to that. Doctors cannot confirm CT during life, as I mentioned. So if doctors can't diagnose CT, how are family members with no medical training right 99% of the time, right? That's sort of impossible. And to give context to that, the best Alzheimer's disease researchers in the world are only accurate maybe 80% of the time on a good day in diagnosing a disease that we've been studying for far longer around the world. And still in life, when you're told your grandmother has CT, they're only, or sorry, Alzheimer's disease, they're only right 80% of the time. And also layer on the idea that I was, I've been the person calling families to get these brains, and especially at the beginning, and I did not reach dozens of families who had football players die of dementia during this time. And 100% of the brains of demented NFL players we've had have had CTE. So it's probably not just 10%. Well, how do we look at what it could be? So think of another scenario they put in there. Let's imagine families caught 20% of the cases. That means 110, really was 110 out of 550 who had CTE, and only one out of the 592 non-cases donated. Maybe a little more realistic. So in this scenario, the prevalence would be nearly 50%. But the curveball here is that in the scenario still, the CT positive families would be 118 times more likely to donate than the non-CT families. Right? We know there's got to be noise here. We know the families weren't right all the time. Um, and I think so that this is something to think closely about. If CT families were 118 times more likely to donate, which is probably not true, the prevalence must be at least 50%. I'm the person who's talked to most of these families. It wasn't whether or not they thought, but they donated not because they thought their loved one had CT. They donated because I called. They donated because they believed in science and somebody in the family was a doctor. Uh, they donated for a million different reasons, but it was never just because they thought the person had CTE or didn't. And a lot of those families were actually donating saying, I want them to be a control. They never had concussions. I didn't notice any big symptoms. I wanted them to be a control, but they still had it. And so I think if you look at this data with a critical eye, it is very unlikely that the NFL CT prevalence is under 50%. Right, if you just look at that 118 number right, we, that we caught, let's say we caught 20% of those cases, that means the minimum prevalence is 50%, but we're probably dealing with this little square here. It's probably some, well, my pointer is not strong enough. Yeah, there, sorry. Um, we're probably dealing with that area there. 
So let's imagine that's reality. What does it mean for football if 50% of the NFL players, the players who watch on TV, have it? Um, and I think it means a few different things. It's a risk for the game of football, right? It's a risk that we will enjoy watching it, knowing that half the players in the field are living with a degenerative brain disease already caused by their entertainment they're giving us. It might mean that people don't put their children in football anymore, thinking that, well, if they succeed, this disease might be you know, better than 50-50 odds. So the reality is that the game really needs to change, right? And so we're trying to push how do we change this game so we don't continue to create this disease? Now, it's been a fight to do this. And part of the reason it's been a fight is that the NFL has been very slow to buy into this CTE football connection. You know, only a couple of years ago, Jerry Jones, after that 110 and 111 study came out, said it's absurd to say there's a relationship between CTE and playing football. He went on to say there's no data in any way that creates a knowledge. There's no way that you could have a comment that there is association and some type of assertion. I will add that Jerry Jones is a football guy, right? He was on the University of Arkansas in 1964, undefeated team. So it might be hard to believe this, right? But we, I will tell you, we already diagnosed two of his teammates from that team with CTE who've passed away. And because the NFL hasn't been willing to buy into the CTE football connection, the changes they've made to the game, which are good, have primarily been focused on concussions. And what we've learned is that your risk of developing CT is not defined by the number of concussions you have, but other factors and these subconcussive impacts. So we know about concussion protocols and independent doctors and no blindside blocks and defensive players and they have no more bad helmets and less, you know, less in practice, changing the kickoff. All of these changes are good for concussions, but what if these aren't enough to change CTE? And I would argue right now they're not for a lot of different reasons, not only just for what's happening in the NFL game. So the other piece of data that's very important and new is that we now know what the major risk driving CTE is. Uh, we published a study in October, Duration of American Football Play in Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. We took 400 brains from our brain bank, 222 brains from that control group, the Framingham Heart Study, and we grabbed all the football players age 20 and over. Now it was 266 football players. 223 of them were CT positive, 43 of them did not have CTE. And we ran all sorts of analytics to try to figure out what are the, what, what are the variables driving this. These are violin plots. And what you'll see here is on the left, you have duration of play in years, zero to 30, and CT status, yes or no. We'll just focus on this one, although there was also finding on CT severity. And what we found is that once you play, what's concerning for those of us who had long careers is once you played over a certain number of years, all of them had it, right? This was, it was years that was driving this. At, at short careers, most of them didn't have it, but at some point, uh, they, they did. Uh, and in fact, only two of our participants in the study who played 14 years or more did not have the disease. So what we learned is that those who play 15 seasons or more may have 10 times the risk of those who play five or fewer that years of play is what's driving this risk. Although I will say, when that, we mentioned that five or fewer, we want to point out we had nine people with CT who played fewer than five years of tackle football in their lives. So what we published, what we learned, is that CTE odds and CT severity are correlated to how many seasons you play. And in fact, the odds of having CT go up 30% per year you play football. And it was a pretty strong finding for those of you who like p-values, this is our p-values, eight zeros followed by a three eight. So about a four in a billion shot, we have this, uh, direction, this directionality wrong. Um, so another way to look at 30% is each 2.6 years you play, your risk doubles. And so that's a curve that looks like this, right? This is a curve that says, okay, a couple years, maybe not increased relative risk, but once you start getting into NFL career years, college football career years, you're talking about extraordinary risk. And what's even more interesting about this curve is it overlays basically exactly with smoking and lung cancer curves. Your excess odds ratios for developing lung cancer go up about 30% per year you smoke. And so we like to use this smoking framework to understand, well, how could we then use this data to change outcomes? Now, uh, also, I'll revisit selection bias. 
So this publication was actually delayed for a year so our really smart statisticians could analyze, is there some bias possible in our brain bank in the way we've gotten brains or the way the brains have come in that makes that 30% number not real? Because that's a very important number. And so you guys will understand this better than I do, but basically we looked at two things. Is duration of play driving brain donation or CT disease status driving brain donation? If they had longer careers, they're more likely to donate. If they had symptoms, that they thought were CT where they're more likely to donate. And basically what they showed is that running a bunch of simulations that worst case or best case scenario for football players, your excess odds ratio is about 22%, but it could be as high as 40% more per year. So we're comfortable saying this 30% number is probably not gonna change anytime soon. We have 90% of the world's cases of football, uh, CT in football. It'll take another decade or two for anyone or for even us to build this large enough to run another analysis that might be different. This is, this is the number we have to deal with. So the 30% increase odds ratio is not driven by selection bias. So what do you do? Well, let's look at what the, the smoking industry did when we, it was basically proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that smoking was causing lung cancer. They, they started with product changes, right? So you notice they, there's filters, right? We added filters, which uh, didn't do anything. Um, we put less tar, we put less nicotine, and we said these are now safe. Uh, and the reality is those things didn't work. We're sort of doing the same thing with football, right? We're saying, okay, we're gonna change the helmets. You're, think of football helmets better as getting better filters on cigarettes. Eh, it'll help a little bit maybe, but it's not gonna solve the problem, right? Um, independent doctors, uh, fewer kickoffs and fewer concussions, all that stuff is good, but those are small product changes that proved in smoking not to work and they're, they're not gonna make a difference in football. What actually worked for changing outcomes in smoking was policy changes, was behavior changes, right? Taxes, location bans, you no longer smoking outside this building, and age bans, right? The age bans might be the most powerful. We're starting to do some of those things with football. Right, so now we have, we're increasing the penalties for head impacts, right? You, you get uh, thrown out of the game. Uh, we're, we're having no off-season hitting and less hitting in practice, right? A behavior change, a lower exposure, that's great. But the reality is that even if these changes did affect CTE risk, they're mostly only made at the NFL level. And some of them can't be implemented prior, and prior to your NFL career is the longest period of time you play football. So, all these changes to the NFL game are cosmetic in terms of CT risk if we're not also making those changes at all levels of football and that NFL player's entire experience. And so the one thing that we're not talking about in football and we need to be is age bands, right? Age bands is what is, works for smoking, right? It was 18 when I was growing up, now it's 21. We need to talk about starting later if we wanna protect kids. And the power of age restrictions in football is enormous. If you think about it, something like smoking, most smokers are adults just you know, as it happens, right? You, do, you start and you stick with it. Football is something that people don't stick with as they get older because it's too damn dangerous, right? 95% of people playing this game causing CT are children, all right? And adults will not play unless you give them millions of dollars. And there are plenty of adults now who will turn down $10 million a year to play one more season of football, all right? Gronk, Andrew Luck, Luke Keekley are walking away from $10 million because they now have some understanding of this risk to their health. Football is a, a, a very wide and flat pyramid, right? All these changes that are being made are being made for 2,000 pros, not really matched in college. There's no real hitting limits in college. And then we're talking about the bulk of exposures happening young, right? So we need to change what happens when they're young if we want to change outcomes. So I would argue age restrictions are really the only answer and the one thing we need to be talking about if we want to talk about CT preventions. Most of these NFL re reforms can't be made at every other level. The NFL has 30 medical professionals at every game, eyes in the sky, watching a video from NFL headquarters to catch concussions and all these things. You can't do that with kids. Um, so as of now though, this age restriction issue is off the table. So I would, what we've been talking about and here in Massachusetts has been a bill, what if this activity Still became stopping. illegal? Go, go. Oh, oh my God. gosh. <laughs> we have to stop hitting kids in the head, right? That's what this comes down to. But because youth sports and football is sort of a capitalist enterprise and there's no governing body that controls it, the only way we would get there is really through legislation or convincing the NFL to tell the public you shouldn't have your kids playing young. And when you look at what that age restriction could be, 
you think about this, this is now a sort of an example curve, not uh, completely accurate, about relative risk, right? A kid who starts at five years old, his odds increasing 30% per year, let's assume your odds after one year is less than 1% of having CT. It goes up relatively slowly, but then it starts to pick up once you're in high school, right? And compare that to somebody who starts at 14. Luckily, like I did, I still thank my mother for holding me out until 14. But what you realize is that if your risk is doubling every two and a half years, the longer you go on with your career, the more risk you have. And at all points in this curve, the difference is 10 times. If you wait nine years and start at 14 instead of age five, no matter when you stop, your risk will be one-tenth those who start at five. And so it's really, if you, t if you worry about risk, even if you started at 14 and you ended at 25, you, you know, this is some you know, sort of a made-up model, but the idea is that your risk might really be low. But if you start at five, and again, as I mentioned, we have two cases who played more than 14 years who didn't have CTE. If you start at five and you make it to the NFL, it's virtually a guarantee at this point, based on our data, uh, right now, we haven't had a case who doesn't have it. And again, I don't want to say it's a guarantee because I know there are a lot of people who have done that. But I want to tell you, from a policy perspective, we need to consider that the risk might be really high. And so we've, tied, we've tried to tie these two concepts together through the, for the, through the Concussion Legacy Foundation because while a lot of our research is focused on how do we diagnose this and how do we treat this in living people, that's going to take decades. But what could be accomplished tomorrow is preventing most cases of this disease. If you look back at their curves, you realize if you just took two and a half years off everyone's career, you would cut CT risk by half. If you took five years off everyone's career, everyone's career, you'd cut it by another half. We're talking about an extraordinary public policy opportunity to prevent this disease. And so people don't always respond to statistics, so we tried to put that smoking concept and, and that similar excess odds ratios along with football with this PSA that actually went viral. So hopefully it's familiar to some of you. How's everybody doing? Are we all right? Great job. You guys are doing it. Tackle football is like smoking. The younger I start, the longer I'm exposed to danger. If you don't let me smoke, when should I start tackle? Hi. Choose flag under 14. Does it make the point? That was fun to do. Um, those kids weren't smoking real cigarettes, in case you were worried. <laughs> Movie magic. But the problem is, uh, again, legislation is very unlikely in this space. It's hard to do. Uh, and so I would argue we need the NFL to back this to change outcomes for, for NFL players down the road. We need them telling people, Kids should not be playing young. The brains are still developing. Too many years is a problem. And we're not getting that. So uh, this is a video of our, spon uh, <laughs> our sponsor. Um, but this is what Bob Kraft recently told uh, WCVB-TV. This was in the, the Aaron Hernandez Netflix documentary. I'm very pleased with what we're doing in the area of equipment, what we're doing with medical attention. And my sons and grandsons played, I played. And I'd recommend to every mother out there who wants her young man to grow up special that they play too. His pulpit is far bigger than ours, right? And people trust him. And so the problem we have is that that's the message they're getting from the NFL. And you know, football might have worked for, for him and his family, but when you look at the data, it's not going to work for everybody. And it's really not going to work if we start everybody at five years old. So. We need their help in changing this message. And the reality is, I'm going to go back to that 50% number, I think when we can actually prove that 50% of NFL players have this, if that's true, and we can actually make it beyond a shadow of a doubt, that will create a major inflection point for the game. I have mentioned earlier, will, will people still play? Will you sign your kids up? Well, the reality is that's already changing. Um, people with other options are starting to walk away. The Aspen Institute recently put out data saying your income is less than fifty thousand uh, dollars. One in six boys are playing tackle football, but if you make a hundred thousand or more, it's one in ten, and that gap is widening. More education is saying this is not for my kid, or my kid's going to play later. But it's the vulnerable people that are signing up early because there's another data that shows that's the only football that's offered in our neighborhood. They don't have flag as an option. Uh, 
And the problem, and the problems from the NFL's perspective on getting them on board is they know that if children don't play football, they're less likely to become fans. Um, they know that if football players keep getting CT, parents will not let their kids play. And I think, you know, I think this inflection point happens at 50%. And we need their backing on this flag football under 14. We need everyone on board with this and we'll have a brighter future. And they're facing a ticking clock because the reality is we're close to that number. We're close to proving this. Uh, either we're gonna have a CT test in the living, there's new publications every year showing how close we're getting, or um, we'll get it through brain donation because that 9.6% study I showed you earlier, over the last two years, we've gotten 37% of brains of NFL players who died. That community is sending us a lot of brains because they're so damaged. And I can't tell you what those numbers are, we haven't finished studying them, but it's still a very high number. So that, that ceiling is no longer, or that, sorry, that floor is no longer 10%, it's higher. And we'll publish what that is when we're done studying them. So I'll wrap up to say, you, you, this new CT data makes it clear that if we don't reform youth football, we won't solve the CT crisis. If we don't solve the CT issue, it's really gonna hurt the NFL's long-term business. And we need their help in convincing them to change the messaging around youth football. And I welcome your ideas in doing that. Thank you very much. You need to contact me, that's some information, but thank you for listening. Now we do have time for some questions, go ahead. It's, it's, it's basically zero if you've not been exposed to trauma. And then the, sorry, the question is, what's the baseline CT rate of population? Zero if you're not exposed to trauma. And then what, you're, uh, what the rate is, is a function of the sports that culture plays. So we're actually funding a 500 consecutive brain study in Brazil at the world's largest aging brain bank study, meaning it's the least biased. We're, we're finding about a 2% rate. So it's probably about a one to 2% rate worldwide, but it's skewed towards those who did something voluntarily to get trauma or people who are victims of abuse or military veterans. Yes? We don't have the same, we, so we have 600 brains in football out of our 850 at the brain bank. We have 15 soccer, 15 rugby, 30 or 40, well, we're nearing 50 hockey. We're 13 for 14 with NHL players. Like it's in these other sports too, but football is where we just have tons of data. And so we're really, and, and football is still the only sport that's really hitting your kid in the head at five years old on purpose. So um, we're fully focused on that. Yes? That's what we're trying to do. We drove that, that, that reform when we showed our first CT cases in soccer players. And we said, well, and we, we were able to get some of the leaders of soccer like Brandy Chastain and Taylor Twelman and Cindy Parlacone to say, why are we heading young? So it's no heading to 11, it needs to be 14. In high school it'll change too in time, but we need to create the data to create that buy-in. I will tell you there's a famous soccer player about to go public talking about some very significant problems that will spur another conversation on that. Uh, yes, and then this. Does the data show yeah, differences by position? The answer is no. And I think the biggest reason why is we don't track special teams very closely. If you were on the kickoff team, no matter what else you played, that was your biggest hits. So I, there probably is, but we don't, no one remembers whether they were L5 on kickoff and how many times they did it, because that changes so much. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, good, it's a popular question. I wish we did have an answer. More questions, yes. We're, di we're, we're digging in on that in a big way. We started a, a program called Project Enlist to recruit more brains, and we're actually, our goal is if we can prove 100 CT cases in the military population, we'll, be get to, we'll get to understand risk factors, and we'll get the government to better support athlete, or better support our veterans who have this. I mean, just right now, we only have a few dozen cases. A lot of them are athletes, too. But we do have a, lot of, we do have a significant number of people exposed to BLAST who did not play contact sports who did develop CT. So we're trying to build that case up by recruiting more brains. I saw one there and then there. The live CT test would entail 
uh, imaging tests. So we're seeing different changes on MRI and atrophy than other, than other diseases. PET scans, we're about to recruit for a, a second generation tau PET leg and blood tests. Spinal fluid, looking for this abnormal tau. Neuropsych tests, looking for different brain function than other neurodegenerative diseases. So we basically just have to do the work because no one had done it before. Uh, and publications will be coming that'll continue to refine what it is. Yes? So we don't have anything that'll stop the disease from progressing, but that's like every other neurodegenerative disease. So what we tell people, and we have a huge program focused on, you know, CT is not a death sentence. You don't have to, you're not gonna commit suicide. You can get help for your symptoms, right? We're not trying to, you know, we, we try to be real about it. We're talking about prevention because it can be horrible. But we also, if you think you have it, we try to message, you can treat the symptoms, you can still live, your, live a good life with it. Um, and so we're, we're trying to help those families, but we don't have a lot of great concrete things you can do besides go to a doctor, treat the symptoms, and stay part of life. There's one back there. Yeah, great presentation. Is there, um, is there a capacity to present this to like public school boards maybe and to like, get the message out that way, or is the primary goal currently to solidify the research to go for lobbying and take that route? Uh, we're trying to do sort of global education on this, you know, and we're doing the same conversations in Australia right now. We, we diagnosed the, the first, our collaborators, the first Australian football league players, and they have tackled really young there, and we're trying to say do it older. Going school to school is very difficult. Very few people are willing to make this cultural change, and it would be just too slow for our, we, I got a team of 12. Um, so we, are, we have supported bills in Massachusetts and New York and, and California and Illinois to have national or state conversations around should we ban it before 12. And we've gotten them out of committee, like the scientists get it, but we're also dealing with the most profitable sport in the country and the most popular sport in the country. And the NFL can out spend us on this, and I, I didn't mention it, but the NFL's put $200 million in recruiting children to youth tackle football since 2000, right? So we're just sort of outgunned and school board to school board is very difficult. Um, there and then in the back. There was a, just a publication that came out last week that said banning three-point stance would help. And I actually missed that doctor's call who did that publication last night, <laughs> but I need to talk to him. So we might, we're gonna start talking about how we retrain kids to play and how we retrain coaches to teach. Yep. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you quote age 14 is sort of a, a magic number, but you said that you don't really have any data from anyone pretty much under the college age. So where does that number come from? So we, we do have 50 some brains of people before uh, that played just through high school. And we do have 20% or so I think that have CTE. The 14 age uh, is both a, a football question and a public health question. But you come to that not through just, just science, but it's like choosing what age is the right age for people to start driving, right? It's a cultural question of risk benefit uh, and what are the needs there. What's different about high school football, it is, is almost always regulated by the state. The coaches are almost always paid. The children are old enough to be able to speak up for themselves and have some, some way to say what's happening. The, some of the, uh, the, their brain is more developed. They have more myelin on their axons. Um, but possibly the simplest way to understand it is, you know, how old are, are you, how old are we putting children into the weight room right now? Right? We're not putting kids into the weight room usually until high school. And what we're worried about is their joint development. Okay? So weightlifting, this is too traumatic for their joints to do it. And we're just trying to make the point that hitting them in the head is actually probably much worse for them before that age. And maybe that's what we shouldn't be doing. So, but we have an infographic at flagfootballu14.org that has 10 good reasons. But again, it's a cultural discussion. It could, we, you know, it, there's no magic number. Yes? What did you learn about the one out of 111? He had a shorter career. We're not releasing the name, though, because there are a lot of people in that 110 who people know donated but don't know the results and, we don't, and don't want to go public with who they were. So we can't release the, the specific data. Um, I appreciate all the questions. I know I guess I've got to stop eventually. So any last one? All right. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.